I'm Anvesh Mazumdar, the National Coordinator for Science Olympiads in India. And it's my uh, pleasure and honor to invite you all to this uh, Infosys Award Function for the Olympiad Medalist of 2016. The award function will start uh, later. Uh, at the beginning, as is the tradition, we have two lectures, uh, one after the other, and then we'll have a break and then the award function will follow. So at the outset, I request all of you to please put your mobile phones in silent mode. So uh, the first speaker today is Professor Sanjay Sane. Uh, Professor Sane obtained a BSc in Physics, Chemistry, and Mathematics from St. Stephen's College in University of Delhi, and then a Master's in Physics from University of Pune, with specialization in astrophysics and nonlinear dynamics. However, he was fascinated with insects from his childhood, and this drew him to study the aerodynamics of insect flight as a PhD student at the University of California, Berkeley. After finishing his PhD, he served as a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Washington, Seattle, and then he joined the National Center for Biological Sciences, NCBS Bangalore, a part of TIFR, where he is currently an associate professor. So, uh, Professor Sane, it's a great pleasure to welcome you and to give you a talk. Just for the students, as a remark, I mean, his career will show you that uh, he started off as a physicist and now he's doing uh, completely uh, different things, maybe uh, which has a lot of physics in it also, but it has a lot of biology. So it's not that what you start off in your early career, you're stuck with that forever. So please keep that in mind in your careers as well. You can always change. Professor Sane. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me here to do a presentation. And it's rare to speak uh, to a room full of such potential. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some work that has evolved, as, as uh, was mentioned earlier, I, my main day job, so to speak, is to study how insects fly. But this project evolved out of a curiosity, uh, almost uh, like a hobby project. And uh, it has grown and grown, and I, I want to sort of share some of the excitement of uh, what we've been finding uh, in this lecture, but also the broader question uh, that, uh, you know, science is in the backyards, you know, that I would really like to emphasize this. There's nothing else that you take away from this talk. Uh, I'd certainly like you to take home the fact that science is right there in your backyards, but I realize this is Bombay, maybe backyards are not common. Uh, Bombay still has a third of uh, uh, its geography is just uh, a jungle, you know, it's the Sanjay Gandhi uh, uh, National Park is, is a fabulous place to be and you're going to find a lot of these sorts of examples out there and also, you know, wherever you can look for them. So let me start with something that you might be more familiar with. So this is uh, human architecture. We understand this. We are instinctively aware of this. We stay in structures that were built by humans. Uh, but the oldest structure here in Cain de Bernanese is uh, uh, you know, fairly uh, sophisticated even at this stage. Uh, this is a building that's uh, uh, said to have been built in 4850 BC. Uh, and this is Manhattan, lower Manhattan as it looks today. And we have a good six to seven thousand years of architecture uh, to look at um, and be proud of. And we often look at this history of uh, six to seven thousand years and think that architecture is the purview of human beings and that we, you know, we've, we've the uh, ultimate knowledge of all this. Um, but it goes back much further than that. So I'm going to give you two examples. These are both from mammals. Um, at your left here is uh, a beaver dam from somewhere in, uh, near Alberta, Canada. Uh, that little rodent there, it's not little, it's actually the biggest rodent uh, that there is, uh, is, is what builds the structures. And it's fascinating, so it's been building these structures for nearly 20 million years. And in the course of this, actually changing 
uh, how rivers move, uh, changing silting rates, making very fundamental impacts on uh, their ecosystem. And, and the reason it does this, uh, at least so far as we know, is that it needs to build a cave in here, right in the middle, which is protected from wolves, coyotes, and all sorts of predators. Uh, it needs to ensure that um, there is enough water surrounding it. And so if, if the stream is somewhat shallow, what it does is it puts together a huge structure here, the beaver dam, uh, that then accumulates these waters and in, in the course of that actually changes uh, everything that happens downstream. On your right here is a prairie dog nest, another rodent. Um, and, and this is just a picture of it, but it has to be a picture because from the outside, all, all you see are little posts. And they're very well conceived, uh, and, but prairie dogs are remarkable uh, at being able to engineer these underground structures in which house uh, their young, their old, their food, and all sorts of things. And they do something even more interesting than that, which is not very evident here, but you can see this little mound on the, uh, on the hole that uh, actually allows for ventilation through the hole. So there's a, some of these holes don't have mounds, some of these have mounds, and then air moves over it. Uh, it naturally flows through because of the pressure difference. And you'll see this theme again in uh, some other structures. Birds are also architects. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the Baya weaver bird, uh, which exists all around us. Uh, and this marvelous structure, uh, it's a nest which uh, houses the eggs of uh, the pair, uh, Baya pair. And it's really uh, a, a masterpiece of uh, weaving and architecture. And it's done with by two two birds with uh, nothing but their beaks and intellect. And if you thought that a structure like this evolved, but once in a you know uh, as a freak incident, and that's not true either. Completely independently of the Baya in, in South America, in the New World, uh, we have this structure that is built by this bird. This is the Oropendula. Uh, and if you were to go to places like Panama or Costa Rica, you would find these hanging um, uh, there. They were completely independently uh, evolved. Now, what's impressive about these structures is that they're able to withstand uh, tremendous winds, uh, cyclones, storms, all sorts of uh, environmental pressures that uh, leave it completely uh, <coughs> And we can go back further in evolution. Here are marine mammals, uh, marine animals. Sorry, this is a worm. Uh, it's called the love worm, Arenicola, um, and it's a solitary worm. What it does is it burrows through the sand, and just like the prairie dog, what it does is it leaves some fecal matter here, and you can see that mound right here. Uh, but leaves the other hole uh, at, at ground level. So there's a difference uh, between the, uh, the heights here and when water flows over this, uh, some of it flows through the, through the tunnel just because of the pressure difference. And uh, this is a filter feeder. So what it does is it filters the water and eats uh, what, as the water is uh, flowing through. And of course, uh, the coral reef is a remarkable uh, structure. Some of these are kilometers long, and uh, as you might be aware, they house uh, all sorts of species. And in fact, they are the backbone of many, many marine ecosystems. And these are all engineered by um, dozens of jellyfishes. Uh, jellyfishes are considered by us to be some of the oldest uh, metazoan, multicellular animals. And yet, uh, here we have structures that are pretty remarkable. So this sort of engineering, and you know, I, I, I could go on and on about principles of, uh, on which they are built and what they teach us about architecture and about how we should uh, engineer our uh, buildings. But you don't have to go uh, to, a, to a Panama or to uh, South America to see these structures. They are all around us. In fact, they're right here. This is. Just, I'm going to just show you four 
examples or five examples from uh, my backyard in Bangalore. Um, and there we see these structures. So here's the hive of a honeybee. I think you're all aware of this. This is Apis dorsata. It's a pretty nasty bee. Uh, it's an Asian uh, honeybee. Uh, and this structure is built literally overnight uh, by a large number of uh, bees. And they are all sort of huddling here. Uh, and this superstructure is built uh, through tremendous coordinated activity between them. And that structure houses uh, their brood, uh, it houses the queen, uh, it is also the store where they store honey. And because it's uh, a structure of this nature that really sort of is the place where all of uh, the colony exists, it must have certain properties. And these are sort of the general things that one sees in any structures which house a lot of uh, individuals. One property is that it should be relatively infection free. Okay, so you can't afford for an infection to come in and then spread through the hive, and then you end up uh, with, with a dead colony. That, that won't work. So the hive has antibiotic properties. And this is uh, something that we all know instinctively. We drink honey, we, uh, we chew on the hive. Wax, it's, it's quite tasty. Uh, here is uh, the nest of a beaver ant. Uh, this is again something uh, ants that we see in our uh, backyard. Uh, these ants, uh, through coordinated activity, are able to uh, go on plants, take leaves, turn them around. As you can see, a lot of them have to work together to be able to do that. And then what they do is they use the, the larvae as some, almost like a toothpaste. If they squeeze the larvae or they stimulate it, the larvae produces a filament. And they use this filament uh, as, as a binding uh, threads that put together this hive. And then this hive, of course, consists of food that they bring. They're carnivores, so they, um, they will catch uh, other insects or dead, dead insects elsewhere and bring it here to feed the young. These are paper wasps, and these again build large uh, nests made out of paper. And they are, in fact, able to uh, chew on uh, certain kinds of plant material, regurgitate it, they turn it into paper. So these extraordinarily large uh, hives are actually very, very large. Uh, and they are able to house, again, brood uh, and uh, their entire colony. Uh, a little less dramatic, perhaps, is a carpenter bee, a, a very large black bee uh, that often gets called gets called a bumblebee. It's not a bumblebee. We don't have bumblebees in uh, below Himalayas in India. Uh, it's this bee, it's the carpenter bee, and what it does is it looks for dead wood, and uh, in the dead wood, it will make a neat little hole with its proboscis, uh, its mouth part, and it's a nice circular hole. And if you were to look inside the hole, there are neat chambers in which uh, they deposit their larvae. And they, they periodically go out, um, hunt, bring in food, and uh, feed their larvae. Now, I'm showing you structures that are products of, of a long process. And in general, I want to talk about science also as a process, not so much as a product. The actual way in which this insect is able to do this is quite remarkable. And it is something that any of you, uh, you know, would, would be able to record with your cell phone cameras. I'm just going to show you a video that I pulled out of YouTube, but this is a really remarkable video. So just watch this. This is a pot of wasp, and what it is doing is making a nest. <coughs> This nest is uh, shaped like a pot. And you can see that in doing so, it's using all its body parts. The antennae are extraordinary mechanosensors. We study these uh, in their role in flight, but they are equally important here. And they keep bringing these uh, balls of clay. And over a period of a few hours, 
we are able to build this remarkable structure. Now, <coughs> right after this comes the part I'm really, uh, that's my favorite part. Right. This insect is a perfectionist. Uh, and what it's going to do, having built this and made sure that it is, you know, has the right uh, structural properties, it's got the right strength, and you know, it's, it's uh, going to be able to withstand uh, whatever um, load that is going, it's going to have to carry. Uh, once it's ensured that, this insect now lays eggs. Those eggs will hatch into larvae, and the insect will then go and periodically bring it food to eat. In fact, it does something quite remarkable. It goes out, uh, it stings a caterpillar, a large caterpillar of a moth or something like that. The caterpillar is um, alive but paralyzed. It's like a zombie. It's then brought here, put in, and the insect larvae will feed on this caterpillar without killing it. Because if it's dead, then it's, it's actually a hazard uh, for the nest. So uh, it's kept alive and and the insect uh, continues to uh, feed both the caterpillar and the, um, and the larvae. Uh, and that's how this whole structure works. This, of course, all of you are familiar with. This remarkable structure is made by a spider. And the spider actually uh, goes to a fair number of uh, iterations uh, to be able to make this uh, structure. Uh, and it serves not only as uh, the place where the spider hangs out, uh, but also uh, as a way of trapping uh, animals, which you can then um, eat. It also serves as a way of harvesting water, like collecting dew drops in the morning. Uh, and it's made out of material that is remarkable. It's about as strong as steel, not stronger. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's able to withstand tremendous loads, for instance, of an insect coming and hitting into this. Uh, it doesn't break the... And to convince you that this structure is a product of extraordinary mental ability, uh, you can actually experiment with something like this. All you can do is feed the uh, spider various kinds of uh, narcotics. So here's a normal spider. Here's a spider on marijuana, benzedrine, caffeine. I'm sure a lot of you identify with that this morning. Chloral hydrate. These are remarkable. And what what these chemicals do is interfere with the coordination of uh, the mental sort of coordination of uh, how these nests are built. And I should point out that that coordination operates both in space and in time. So it, it has to, they, they have to do things together at the same time uh, while also being uh, able to keep track of what they have achieved and how much further they need to go. Um, this is really something that uh, requires tremendous amounts of uh, mental ability uh, and insects have. So, these are the sorts of things that we were gossiping about for a long time in my lab uh, up until a few years ago uh, when we decided finally to do something about it. We've gossiped some, about something for a long enough time. It's a good idea to just take it up as a career. Um, and that's sort of what we did. And uh, specifically, what we were interested in was uh, of these structures. Uh, these are termite mounds. And they existed in our backyard. I'm sure many of you have seen these. Uh, this particular structure, so this is uh, the student who works with this. His name is Amritanj. He's about six feet tall. Uh, and the structure is slightly taller than that. Okay. And there's as much of it above the ground as there is underneath it. Okay. So what the termites are doing is excavating material, putting it on top, and then shaping it into these remarkably fluted structures. You can see these folds in the structure. And uh, this entire structure houses its colony. And we've been trying to understand what it means. 
what is this structure all about? What is the function of this structure? Why is this structure required? By the termites, how is it that certain termites can survive without it? Uh, certain other species of termites. And many questions like that. Now, underneath this structure are some remarkable things. So, first of all, there are millions of termites. Uh, and these termites are uh, segregated into castes. There are soldiers, there are uh, workers uh, of two types, major and minor workers. And then there are these, uh, these termites called alates. Alates uh, come from the word ailer, meaning wing bear. And the alates uh, possess wings. So these are the only termites that can actually fly. And uh, you might have seen them uh, in large numbers uh, after the first rain. They, they are all over the lights, and uh, you know they, they make a lot of mess. Now, in many colonies, termites cannot actually the termites eat wood material, uh, plant material, uh, but many of the termites can't actually digest this material. Some can, some can. Those who can have certain bacterial uh, uh, bacteria in their guts, which help them digest it, but those who cannot. And particularly, these mound building uh, termites uh, form a fungus uh, with it that grows only in this mound. It can't grow outside. It has to grow inside the mound. It is farmed. It is carefully tended to. It is kept in many different chambers. And in fact, if you were to look at the metabolic uh, rate of this mound, a large part of it uh, is accounted for by the fungus, not the, uh, the termites. So you might actually. If you were uh, somebody who works on fungus, turn the question around and say, hey, you know, what's maybe it's a fungus mound and the termites are just uh, being recruited to help the fungus out. Uh, inside this mound is a complex maze of tunnels and bridges and all sorts of uh, crazy uh, architecture that we do not understand. It's topologically complicated and it's uh, um, mechanically, of course, really, really uh, hard to discern. But let me just show you a quick film. This was uh, shot by a cell phone camera by my student. I call it While the City Sleeps. So this is NCBS at night. So we go down in. And there is a busy, busy mark. Busy, busy nest of termites. And you can see just how much activity is going on there. Um, look hard, you might not see any um, graphic germs in there. And I'll come to that in a bit. So, let's briefly think about what, what termites are, what these mounds are. Termites are uh, actually cockroaches. They are cockroaches that have become social, okay? And uh, they tend to, so they are, they, you know, if you are looking uh, from the point of view of an evolutionary biologist, they are they're very, very similar. And so these mounds are built by these termites. And when it rains, uh, or at the first sign of increase in humidity in the environment, there are little chambers. And these chambers are uh, somewhere at the side of the mound where termites will come and they'll open this chamber and they'll release this special class of termites or the alates. As you can see, all of them have wings. They also have eyes. Yeah, I'll tell you a little later that uh, most other termites don't have eyes. Okay. So these are released one by one. They, they hope make a hole just large enough for these uh, termites to go up, uh, these alates to go up, and then they go out and they mate. After they're gone, the hole is closed and the termites go back in. Um, so these will mate, okay? They'll mate and then they will get rid of their wings immediately. And then they begin to grow, okay? So this is now a female, and she's about as big as my thumb. A termite is about a few millimeters in size. This female is about as big as my thumb, okay? And most of her is just ovaries, nothing but eggs. She's just 
big egg machine. And her body is that big, it's wispy little sort of vestigial kind of body. Uh, you can see that she had eyes because she was an ally, uh, little legs, but she's not going to be able to move around. But she is the one who actually controls the mom. And she ensures that all of these soldiers and workers uh, are working and they are, uh, you know, she controls the rate at which she produces these uh, individuals. And she can go on and on for about uh, a few decades, to 10 to 20 years. All along, she has a, uh, a mate that continues to make this mound. And that mound is this incredible structure that I just mentioned. And we've been trying to understand what its function is. Uh, this is uh, my collaborator, Rupert Soar, is an architect from the UK. And he came up with a method of trying to figure out what the internal structure of the mound is like. What are the different uh, mazes and tunnels and so on inside. And what he developed was a very nice method where what he, he cuts off a bit, little bit of the mound and pours in it uh, gypsum, uh, after of Paris, uh, fills it. And then at the end of the day, he sort of allows it to harden and washes off all the mud. Uh, what you get then is a negative image of the mark, negative 3D image of the mark. And uh, that's, that's what he is uh, probably sitting next to. Uh, it's, it's a really wonderful structure. And that allows us then to reconstruct uh, you know, what the internal structure of the mark might look like. And it, as you can see, a lot of it, because this is filled and it's a negative image, a lot of it is just empty space with lots of pages. As to the function of the mound, there are many, many ideas. And I'm just going to play you a, a short video um, by my hero, uh, David Attenborough, uh, as he is talking about this mound. And I think he does a fabulous job uh, of explaining this. So I, I thought it's just better to share that with you. It's from uh, life in here with you. So termites can take refuge from the heat below ground, where it's cool and relatively stable. But two million insects living below ground create a different. It's like a fortress. It keeps the termites uh, safe from ants and so uh, and other predators. Uh, but in addition to that, we uh, have been wondering about what uh, what is it that that the mound uh, does for the termites. Uh, for the and there are a few ideas, again, as was also mentioned in the video earlier, but these are by no means uh, something that we know for a fact. I mean, these are developing and we're still trying to figure out uh, much of this. One idea is that the, the termite mound serves a thermoregulatory purpose, meaning that it, it is required to keep the temperatures uh, inside the mound uh, at some uh, constant level. The second idea is that these serve as uh, some sort of uh, uh, chimneys to allow the, uh, the stale air, the carbon dioxide that is generated by the column uh, to go out at periodic um, intervals. And these are um, structures that then can be manipulated as and when the uh, stale air that increases termites go, you know, and they sort of ventilate the mount by opening or closing these chambers. These are all big questions. We really don't know the answers to this. And uh, you know, much as uh, uh, there's, there's been a lot of uh, theories on this uh, for nearly 100 years, a lot of them actually have been uh, turned out to be dead end. And so we continue to work on this. What has <coughs> been especially interesting uh, is how is it that single termites, which don't carry blueprints, and in fact, which don't even have eyes. As you can see, this is the head of a termite. Uh, there are no eyes. Uh, they have these impressive antennae, uh, these mandibles that you saw were being used uh, in, in fighting, but they're also used in hunting materials. But they don't have eyes. And how do they know what to do? And what are the cues that are used by these termites uh, to, to uh, put together uh, a mouth? And they're busy. You know, they're continually uh, modifying and remodeling the mouse structure and trying to make sure that uh, its integrity is maintained. 
They can actually increase its size um, depending on moisture levels. And what they're doing is constantly collecting. And if you concentrate on any one termite in this video, you can see that what they're doing is really sort of taking material and depositing it, uh, taking material from one place, depositing it in another. And in fact, what they do is they ingest the soil and they mix it with uh, uh, lignocellulose, so it, which is sort of digested plant material. And that's what makes this, uh, this glue work so well. <laughs> so the main question that we are tackling is what is the function of the mice? How do termites know where to build? How do they manipulate the building material? And let me remind you that the building material is soil, but that soil changes from place to place. And the same termites might build a mound in the Western Ghats with very different soil than it does in Bangalore uh, with, with a more clay soil. And also what sensory cues guide individual termites in this uh, building task. How do they sense their environment and how are they responding to it? But before we even ask questions like this, and that the sort of just the way we work, um, we decided to not take any, uh, make any assumptions. We say, let us just start with the null hypothesis that the termite mount has no function. And the idea is that if it is true that the termite mount has no function, and that it's just a side product, you know, it has to pull out material, so this is just a way of depositing the material. But if that is true, then it shouldn't care about any injury to the mount. Okay, and so that's the first hypothesis that we decided to test. The idea is very simple. What you do is you go in, you make a hole in the mound, and you ask, what will the termites do in response to this hole? And so that's what we've done here. Uh, my student, uh, Sri Krishna Varmaraja, made a hole about two centimeters in size, uh, in diameter, and we wait. And in about 23 minutes after uh, the first termite shows up, the hole is filled. It's filled with a scab. And let me just show you the, the way it is. Okay, so that's the video here. The plot here tells you just what fraction of the, uh, the hole has been filled, 100 being a fully filled hole and 0 being a fully open hole. What we do then is we uh, analyze the images uh, to, to, to look at what that fraction is. And so as you can see, if you do this, and if you do this again and again, you'll, you'll keep getting the same form of the curve. The curve is a sigmoid. Um, and this is sort of the ratio of the uh, cover to the total area. And we keep doing this experiment over and over again, and we keep getting the same result, except that the sigmoid might look slightly different. It might be shallower or steeper, but it's always uh, a sigmoid. And that suggested to us that there must be uh, an exponential sort of recruitment process uh, and an exponential de-recruitment process that's ongoing. Uh, and so we then decided to sort of take the line when the, the student was interested in some theoretical aspects of this. We thought, yeah, we could build a model. So we have to make a few assumptions. One of the assumptions was that the rate of building is a good proxy for the number of termites. In other words, the rate at which the building is happening indicates how many termites are at work. A corollary of that is, of course, that each termite is uh, working at some constant rate. So you know, then you can actually use this assumption. How might such recruitment work? It could be chemically mediated. So it might be that a termite shows up at a place finds a hole there, we don't know how, but then lays down a chemical. And then that chemical attracts other termites, which then from there, they find the hole, they lay down the chemical. And that could lead to a, a recruitment process that's exponential. Uh, because the number of termites that are recruited are directly proportional to the number of termites that are on the spot. It could also be mediated by sound. We know just from observations in the lab that termites can vibrate their heads very, very rapidly. And these vibrations actually lead to um, a sound that you can hear. 
The de recruitment could be mechanically mediated because the termites are proud and then they stimulate each other to stop work. Sort of like uh, local business. Um, there could be other means. I mean, these are just some, uh, some ways in which we do. So, how do you actually go about testing even some of these assumptions? Uh, so my student, Amritanj, came up with a very nice method. What he did was he, instead of uh, uh, just making a hole, he put a funnel there. Now, what the termites do is they come out and they start uh, building over the funnel. And that's sort of what it looks like when you take a picture from above. And now you can see the termites actually on the surface. And you can measure the rate at which they're building. And so you can ask, is the number of termites uh, a good proxy for the rate of building? Uh, oh, sorry, the other way around. Is the rate of building a good proxy for the number of termites? And that turns out to be a pretty nice assumption. So uh, here is the area built. Here is the number of termites. There are many uh, different trials. There are about 10 of them. But here's just one of the trials. And you can see that uh, this regression is pretty high. We know that, uh, indeed, this is a good assumption. So we can then put this assumption into a larger kind of a mathematical model. I won't go through the details of this model, except to say that you can put these assumptions in, build a model. And what you get out of it is a differential equation, which once you solve, you get a sigma. And that's not surprising. You know, you sort of get what you put in. But uh, this model is useful because you can play around with the constants and then start asking questions that go back to the biology. You can ask, for instance, how do you change the rates at which uh, termites are building? How do you uh, make a sigmoid shallow or steep or something like that? But let's go to the question of uh, the sensory cues that are uh, being used. So for that, we developed a, a, a variation of the, uh, uh, the funnel assay, which is a parallel plate assay. What you do is instead of putting a funnel there, you put a parallel set of parallel plates, and they start building on the parallel plates. And you can film from the sides. Um, and you can. Uh, you get time-lapse images that allow you to see the rate at which the termites are built. And so that's what it looks like. Uh, this is the uh, hole. That's where the parallel plates are kept. And uh, we use this then to ask, how is the rate at which they're building different? So this is an experiment that was done through the day. Uh, it starts at 8 in the morning, ends at about 10 in the night. And as you can see, in the morning hours, these rates are very steep. But as they go towards evening, they began to get shallow. And this was something that prompted us to ask the question, could it be that light is in it? Could also be temperature, but we first thought to ask about light. And for that, we came up with uh, two sets of experiments. One is uh, this mound in the shade. Uh, so we have a uh, mound in the shade, so the temperature is more or less constant at both places. Well, what we do is we make two holes at the same height and insert in those holes uh, tubes that are either transparent or covered with black paper. Now something interesting happens. In the tubes that are transparent, the termites fill the tube entirely with mud. It's completely filled. In those which have a, a black paper on top, uh, they only uh, fill up the walls, but not the uh, set, not the pores. And you can weigh these muds and see uh, that, that there is significant difference between these two uh, methods. So what this suggested to us was that the light is a sensory cue, which was very surprising because, as I mentioned, these termites don't have eyes. Um, so we wanted to double check, and so here's another assay. What we do is this time is have a parallel plate assay, but the core uh, of it is an aluminum plate, which doesn't uh, uh, have a light doesn't go past it. We keep one side in light and the other side in dark, and we ask how is the rate of building different in these two And as you can see, uh, this is one side and this is the other, and there's a, a different uh, amount of building in, in these two places. And these are multiple trials. Uh, the, the black bar is uh, the light part, and the dark uh, part is the red bar. And you can see that al always 
the light uh, is more building and the dark. So we knew then that they can see. I mean, they can sense light, and that light is a cue. So when you make a hole in the mom, it brings in light, and that light activates the termites to come and start uh, building over it to minimize that light. It's in some sort of neg negative feedback loop. So I'll leave this here, and I'll go to another question that we've been pursuing, which is uh, about termite mounds and moisture. And we know that when it rains, there is a lot of uh, humidity. But this is something that has been known for many, many years. There are, these are just two um, Sanskrit couplets, which uh, were pointed to me by a student who knows a little bit about uh, this. And she mentioned that there are these two couplets in which there's this indication that wherever you see a termite mark is, is some indicator of where uh, the there is a water source underneath. Okay? So the word Valmiko, Valmik is, uh, is the uh, Sanskrit equivalent of the termite mark. It's actually literally an anthill, but it's not an anthill, it's a termite mark. And so here it says that if there's an anthill near the jambu tree, always uh, uh, towards the seas, you will find a good water source at uh, two purushas, the length of a human body uh, from there. And here, uh, uh, two other trees, so you have Tal and Alakeri, surrounded by anthills. There should be an aquifer towards the west at a distance of four purushas, or six Um So, and, and when you talk to people, they mentioned that you know there is some relation between uh, where the mounds are and where there are water sources. We were interested in this question because we know that soil moisture is very important. But how do termites uh, use soil moisture? What, what effect does soil moisture have on the building process? So you can see that there is a new mound right here. There's the old mound. This happened right after the rain. That this is a more moist uh, soil than this. So we again used the parallel plate uh, assay for uh, this purpose. And what we did was have a series of five plates in which we put completely dry soil first and then variable amounts of moisture. So we know exactly how much water is, uh, moisture is in there. And then we drop in 30 termites in each. And then come back 45 minutes later, and you see that there's a differential amount of building. It loses multiple number of times. 